From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. The U.S. House of Representatives will vote on a new immigration bill a day after U.S. President Donald Trump signed an executive order to stop the separation of migrant children from their parents at the U.S.-Mexico border. Democrats have opposed the bill as they say it will increase funding for the border wall and will limit the intake of legal migrants to the country. This vote comes at a time when Trump faces widespread public outcry and worldwide condemnation over his zero-tolerance policy towards immigration. In the past six weeks, over 2,000 children have been separated from their parents when entering the United States. Migrants' rights activists have criticized this executive order signed by Trump, saying it continues with a hardline approach towards immigrants. The order says instead of separating the children from their parents, they will be detained together. The activists also point out right now, that the decree doesn't say what will happen to the families and, uh, who have already are, been separated. We all very much have the same views. We Latin American immigrants released from a detention center in McAllen, Texas, were happy to hear the news, but are still uncertain about what will happen next. This is good news for the Latino community because no one has the right to separate children from their parents. Seeing so many kids crying and asking for their moms was just unfair. All the women there, we were in terror because many of them had seen their children taken away from them. Our correspondent in Washington, Jorge Gestoso, has more on this story. Thank you. There's still a lot of confusion on how it's going to be implemented the executive order of President Trump at two levels. One, how the parents are going to get together with the 2,300 children that has been spread out all over the United States. And the second part is, even though the executive order stopped the separation of children with parents, only have 20 days to come into the country with the children. After 20 days, the children has to be separated again. So there is still a lot of confusion. There is not going to know how long it's going to take children to get together with parents. There are cases, for example, that parents have been deported already to Central American countries mostly, and the kids are already here. So they don't know that the parents are not in the country any longer. So. Uh, there's still going on a lot of question marks, and that is exactly the most important thing that is going on today. People do not know exactly what the executive order is going to be implemented and how the kids are going to get again reunited with their parents. We'll get back to you now. Jorge Estoso from Washington. The front runner in Mexico's presidential election has welcomed the end of the separation of immigrant families order. At a campaign rally 10 days ahead of the election in Mexico, Andrés Manuel López Obrador said Trump's policy had been racist and inhumane. The Mexican Congress also condemned the policy and called on the Mexican president to suspend all cooperation with the United States in areas of migration and law enforcement. I think it's a good thing. It's always wise to change your opinion, especially on humanitarian affairs. Thousands of people in Mexico are using social networks to protest against the intention of the government of Enrique Peña Nieto to privatize water resources and to hand them over to foreign interests. These rivers are in danger thanks to the elimination by a presidential decree of the ban that restricted the exploitation of over half of the country's clear water resources. This will now allow their use for private and extractivist interests Due to widespread citizen complaints in social networks, the director of the National Water Commission was forced to appear before the media. As I said, there will be no new law of national water. We won't allow our drinking water resources to be used in fracking. And this administration won't make any concessions on this topic. 
While this subsidiary body refuses to bow down to the commercial intentions of the presidential decrees, aquifer legislation experts are warning of loopholes that affect up to 20% of Mexican water resources. They lift in vents completely. In a lot of basins, a part of them was set aside for preservation, but the rest was left without protection. The main problem lies in the commercial and interventionist regulation of this natural resource. Since 1992, the U.S. has demanded a water law in Mexico as a condition to enter NAFTA, a law that effectively turned national water resources into merchandise. Since 2012, people have insisted on a new water law, but Congress has delivered only cosmetic reforms without attacking the problems. There has to be a new water law without a commercial logic, a law that focuses on human rights and upholds the Constitution. The law has to give power to citizens. The presidential decree of June 5th has affected 300 above-ground water basins out of the 758 rivers across the country. Citizens and water defense organizations are fighting for water water to be a public resource and a sovereign property of the nation. Pablo Perez Garcia, Telesur. Now let's move to Colombia, where a key part of the peace agreement is at risk after disagreements in Congress. The lower house passed a bill on the special jurisdiction for peace as requested by the outgoing president Juan Manuel Santos. However, the Senate postponed its discussion and vote as demanded by the president-elect Ivan Duque. The former presidential candidate and opposition leader Gustavo Petro said these obstacles are happening because some want to hide the truth. The special jurisdiction for peace is the mechanism of transitional justice created to judge those involved in the country's internal conflict. Analysts believe that those who oppose the jurisdiction actually want political impunity for people who have benefited from the armed conflict. We have more in this report. The special jurisdiction for peace is still in the limbo after the Senate's debate on its bill was postponed. President Juan Manuel Santos has made an urgent call for Congress to act. I want to make a new call to the Congress of the Republic so that it approves that procedure, so the special peace jurisdiction can operate. The Senate once gave its word to the international community and the victims, but today it appears back in the interest of those who were once behind the war. To reject the approval of the procedures for the special jurisdiction for peace, it's a way of protection, of impunity, to stay in the shadows, and this is a blow to the victims. Members of the legal commission that created the special jurisdiction for peace assure that the fair in the bill means hiding the truth about the crimes that happened during the armed conflict. It reflects the interest of the next government of Ivan Duque to prevent and restrict the special jurisdiction for peace from knowing about state crimes. I think the crimes committed by the Colombian state are really serious and it deepens a model of political impunity. According to the judges of special jurisdiction of peace, the victims are most affected. This procedure will give peace to the country's victims and to all sectors of society. The Interior Ministry assured that changing the regulations of the special jurisdiction for peace is creating a legal limbo. The majority in Congress don't have the will to support peace in this legal limbo. Members of the public force who recover their freedom with the commitment to submit to the special jurisdiction for peace. The plenary session of the House of Representatives refused the proposal of the Democratic Center to postpone the debate of the bill. Meanwhile, the Senate will have to define the future of the special jurisdiction for peace in an extraordinary session. We'll take a short break now, but join us again after this video from our multimedia team.
Más puta. Más puta. ¿Para dónde? Para dónde. Bien, muy bien. joining us again. We return now to Mexico, where the case of the 43 Ayotzinapa students who disappeared in 2014 is being featured by none other than the Royal Shakespeare Company in Britain. A new play called Day of the Living is on at the other place in Stratford-upon-Avon. It uses masks, music and Mexican folklore to tell the story of the students who were seized by the police as they tried to travel to a demonstration and then disappeared. Four years later, the students' relatives are still campaigning against what they believe is a cover-up by the government. So joining, now us, joining us now from Stratford-upon-Avon is Álvaro Flores, one of the actors in the play. Hello, Álvaro, and thank you for your time. Hello, Carla. Thank you for um, having us uh, here on, on your program from the South. It's great to be here. Thank you. So, Stratford and the Royal Shakespeare Company seems a long way from Ayotzinapa, Mexico. What is the company and yourself are trying to do to accomplish with this play? Well, um, I think we're trying to um, spread the message that these, these things are happening, these things happened, you know, these atrocities, in specific about Ayotzinapa. Um, and I think um, at the end we want the world to know, because once the world knows, we cannot pay, uh, we cannot be blind to it. Uh, and it's a wonderful opportunity that the RSC is, is, is willing to, to be part of this voice. So most of the viewers, of course, haven't seen the play yet. Um, so can you tell us yeah. more about what, it, uh, what the play does? Yeah, the play, um, well, the, the, the team did quite a lot of research um, in, through um, journalist papers, investigations, uh, verbatim. So um, the play mixes a, a few um, styles of performance, as you said, um, mass work, musical, um, singing, uh, just plain storytelling, verbatim. Um, and we pretty much throw everything in there to explain um, or to depict in as many ways as possible the reality that, that these families have gone through. Um, so we, uh, it's the, the idea is, is to tell the story without um, putting a voice where, where we don't know what people would have thought, like, like the people that went through this. Um, that's, so that's why we have the masks. So the mask represents um, the, the, those that don't have a voice at the moment. Um, and the verbatim is, is the verbatim that we got from interviews to other students that were around when it all happened. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what we're kind of like trying to, to, to show. So what do you think this case, the Yatinampa students being missing, has got the imagination of so many people around the world? Because it's 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 cruel, it's it's wrong, um, you know. To all of us, I, I'm I'm from Mexico, of course, and um, I guess when when so much violence and corruption happens, you become a little bit um, blind to it. And with this project, to all of a sudden find out or, or, and hear that there was that there was a student, for example, that his the, the the mask of his face was cut off while he while he was still alive and taken off, and his eyes were taken. Off. And you're like, you know, it, it's, it cannot keep on happening. Um, so that's, I think, people wake up to this violence that, that, that is happening um, right now in Mexico, but it's also uh, happening in other parts of the world. Um, and it's, it's great to see people shaken and, and people wait at the end of the play to have a word. And then they ask, what can we do about this? How can we help from here? Thank you very much, 
Alvaro, for your time and for your effort on this play. Thank you, Carla. So let's go to another story. The Brazilian government is urging people to get the flu shot before the start of the winter. More than 400 people have died from the common flu, twice as much as last year's figures. Vitor, Lucian and their three-year-old daughter came to this health center in Sao Paulo to get the flu shot together. With winter around the corner, they say you can't be too careful. We are doing this as a preventive measure. Because there have been several cases, we decided to get anyone vaccinated. So far this year, more than 400 Brazilians have died from flu. Although the number is small compared to Brazil's population, the government is worried about the number of deaths, which has doubled from last year. Health authorities say the virus is not different from other years, but it has spread quicker. The viruses are the well-known H1N1 and the H2N3 and the influenza B. The three types are covered by the program's vaccine. Most likely, the infection rate is higher this year because the winter is colder than usual. Dr. Elena Sato oversees the immunization program in the state of Sao Paulo. She says the priority now is to vaccinate the main target groups, teachers, health workers, pregnant women, children under five, and the elderly can have the vaccine for free. I think it's very important to take the flu shot, especially in my age, and I work with the elderly so I have to be extra cautious. One of the vaccines included in this dose is against the H1N1 virus, or swine flu. This strand is solely responsible for half of all this year's deaths. However, the Ministry of Health also says most deaths were registered in people over the age of 50 with existing conditions. 60 million doses of the vaccine have been distributed to meet the Ministry of Health's target to vaccinate more than 54 million people. However, several centers across the country have registered shortages. This health center in Sao Paulo is receiving 1,200 people a day to get the flu shot. But despite the rush to get the vaccination done, 23% of the target group is still not protected. So the government is extending the deadline of the vaccination program until the 22nd of June in hopes of preventing more cases and more deaths in the upcoming winter. This is Melberti for Telesur in Sao Paulo. The Peruvian Constitutional Court is set to rule on a request by a gay couple to be recon recognized as a marriage in a civil registry. The court met on Wednesday to hear the request of the two men who married abroad. Civil unions or equal marriage are not recognized in Peru. The court's decision could take up to 12 weeks, but LGBTI groups are hopeful that if favorable, it would create a precedent for other married homosexual couples to be recognized. The remains of 34 victims of the internal conflict in Peru were returned to their families after almost three decades. The remains were taken to the remote Amazon village of Nailamp de Sonomoro. The victims were murdered back in 1990 by the Shining Path armed group, among them a pregnant woman and eight children. The attack killed one-tenth of the community's population that was formed by 70 peasant families. The Peruvian internal conflict lasted from 1980 to 2000 and left nearly 70,000 people dead. The bodies of 172 civil war victims were returned to the indigenous village of San Juan Comalapa in the outskirts of Guatemala City. A mass was held before burying the recovered remains in the formal facili former facilities of the local military barracks. The civil war hit Guatemala for 36 years from 1960 until 1996, fought between the U.S.-backed authoritarian states and various rebel groups. The conflict killed and disappeared over 150,000 people. Grenada officially opens its new parliament building on Thursday. The building opens on the 100th day of the Keith Mitchell administration. It's expected to be a grand affair with representatives from the United Arab Emirates and Mexico, who were instrumental in the construction of the multi-million dollar building. Several regional leaders are expected to attend the opening ceremony, including prime ministers and Trinidad and Tobago, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We'll take a last short break, but join us after another video from our multimedia team.
For our World Cup update, Peru is down one goal against France. Now their stay in the World Cup is in jeopardy. Kylian Mbappe scored France's first goal at the 34th minute. With this result, the French team would qualify for the next round. Australia and Denmark equalized one all during their morning match. Later, Argentina will try to obtain their first victory against Croatia. For the first time in decades, women in Iran were allowed to watch a match inside a stadium along with men. The breakthrough came at the Asadi Stadium in Tehran, where fans came to follow the World Cup match against Spain. Female fans had been able to buy tickets for the event in a country that has traditionally banned women from attending games between men's teams. Reportedly, when they reached the stadium, police tried to prevent them from entering as authorities changed their mind at the last minute. However, the women refused to leave, and just an hour before the match began, the doors were open for them as well. Now to Venezuela, where oil, oil minister Manuel Quevedo has said U.S. sanctions on Venezuela are an attack against the stability of the global oil market. Quevedo was speaking in Vienna, Austria on Thursday at a seminar at the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC. He said the sanctions are a direct attack against the stability of the oil market, calling it an unconventional war with the world's largest oil consumer. He told the other leaders Venezuela's situation should not be ignored, since it could be any of them next. Turkey is preparing for its presidential and parliamentary elections on Sunday. It's the first time Turks will vote in these two elections simultaneously. The main presidential candidates are President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of the Justice and Development Party, Muharrem Ince of the Republican People's Party, Meral Aksener of Good Party, and Sela Hatin Demirtas from Pro-Kurdish Pro People's Democratic Party. Demirtas is in prison since November 2016 on terrorism-related charges. He is the country's first candidate to contest from jail. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has become only the second world leader ever to give birth while in office and the first to take maternity leave. 
Arden gave birth to her first child, a baby girl, in the country's largest public hospital. She became New Zealand's youngest Prime Minister when she took office last year. Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters has stepped in as Acting Prime Minister for the next six weeks. Downward facing dogs, cobras and warriors sprouted all over India on Thursday for International Yoga Day. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi led the way performing his asanas with over 50,000 others in the northern city of Dehradun. In 2014, he convinced the United Nations to accept June 21st as the International Yoga Day. Since then, every year, grand yoga sessions have marked the day around the country. Breaking news from Spain, where a court has granted provisional detention to members of the Wolfpack, which means the accused could be released from prison in a few hours. According to this decision, the five men accused of raping a young girl in the San Fermin festivities back in 2016 could get out of prison if they pay a bill of 6,000 euros. The case awoke a wave of feminist demonstrations in the country. With, the, with this decision, it is suspected that Spanish women will go back to the streets. And before we end today's show, let me remember, remind you that you can watch our special World Cup program with Argentina football star Diego Armando Maradona. De la mano del 10, the World Cup according to Maradona. It will air only on Telesur every night during the World Cup in Russia. And these are the times to watch it, so don't miss out. And with that, we come to the end of this news brief. But this and other stories, you can find them on our website, telesurtv.net slash English. And be sure to follow us also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.